All Christians who take the Bible seriously recognize the need for repentance and confession before God. After all, St. John says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then look at what the Bible tells us about confession. In the Bible, the penitent confession of sin is the open acknowledgement of sin before both God and man. The book of Leviticus says that when a man is guilty of any of these, he shall confess the sin he has committed, and he shall bring his guilt offering to the Lord for the sin which he has committed. In the Old Testament, the penitent would bring his offering for sacrifice to the priest at the door of the tabernacle. Then he laid his hands on the animal that was to be sacrificed and confessed his sin in the hearing of the priest. The sacrifice would then be offered and the pardoned sinner sprinkled with the sacrificial blood. The priest who performed the sacrifice was said to make atonement or to make reconciliation for the sin before God. Think about the symbolism of the ritual. The sinner, by confession, uncovers or lays bare his sin before God and before the priest and before the holy community. The penitent is then sprinkled by the priest, covered by the sacrificial blood that restores the penitent to holiness in God's covenant community. So it is with us in confession. We strip ourselves of our sins and our pride. Then we are covered, reclothed once more in our baptismal holiness and restored to communion by the power of Christ's precious blood and through the ministry of a priest. Only in one place in the Bible do we hear of a confession of sin made solely to God in personal private prayer. That was by the prophet Daniel, when he confessed before God the sins of his nation that had brought about their exile to Babylon. But even in that instance, Daniel's confession was not a purely individualistic matter. Rather, Daniel was praying and making reparation on behalf of himself and others. Biblical confession is not purely private. Daniel, seeing the exile of his people in Babylon as a sign of God's judgment, says, Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and supplications, with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Daniel was in exile. The Jews were in bondage, the holy city conquered, and the great temple in ruins. Daniel had no access to the temple and its sacrifices, or to a functioning priesthood. In seeing his people's hopes reduced to ashes, Daniel sees also the Lord's call to repentance. So even though he confesses privately, He does so as a member of God's holy people, pleading for himself and for them, facing toward the Jerusalem temple. Even though the priesthood and sacrifices are no longer available to him, Daniel's act of contrition is oriented toward the temple, where the priests can make atonement for Israel's sins. If he could have had access to the temple and its priestly ministry, Daniel would undoubtedly have gone to them in his repentance for his sins and those of his people. Daniel was in a situation like that of a Catholic who has no access to confession, but makes an act of contrition, which includes within itself the implicit desire for confession and the willingness to have recourse to it, if it were possible. Another example. When King David committed adultery with Bathsheba and brought about the death of her husband Uriah, he was called to repentance by the prophet Nathan. David then confesses his sin and begs pardon, and Nathan can then say, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. You see, God does forgive, yet God works through a human minister in this case, the prophet Nathan. After the return from Babylon, the priest Ezra 
who called the Jews to repentance and to the restoration of the temple, said, Now then make confession to the Lord, the God of your fathers, and do his will. For the Jews had entered into invalid marriages with Gentiles, and had gone astray in many other ways, following the ways of the nations rather than those of the God of Israel. And so we read, Then all the assembly answered with a loud voice, It is so, we must do as you have said. Note that all of this is said aloud in a communal setting. Confession is before both God and man. Sin and repentance are not really private matters, but concern the entire community of God's holy people. In the New Testament, we are told that John the Baptist, who was a priest of the Old Covenant as well as a prophet like Nathan, was baptizing in the Jordan, and that the penitents were confessing their sins. They must have been saying these aloud so that John could hear them. It was more than just a silent mental act that they were doing as they came for baptism. Their confessions were evidently spoken aloud. You could even say that John the Baptist was, so to speak, hearing confessions as part of his baptismal ministry. Now it is true that the biblical texts do not tell us how specific these confessions of sin were. One would suppose that it depended on the sin and on the circumstances. What is clear is that sin and reconciliation in the Bible are not solely private and personal matters. Breaking God's law inevitably affects others, and the way of pardon and restoration takes place within a covenantal community and normally through a priestly ministry. The same is true of confession in the New Testament. In the New Covenant, too, there is still a visible priesthood and confession and sacrifice. A priesthood to whom Christ has given the power of binding and loosing. The risen Christ tells us so. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. So we read in St. John's Gospel. The priests and the bishops of today share in that apostolic mission and authority to hear confession, to impose penance, and to absolve from sin and guilt, and thus to reconcile with God himself. As St. Paul writes to the Corinthians, All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We beseech you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. Think for a moment of the parable of the prodigal son. Every detail of that marvelous parable in Luke 15 is significant. When the prodigal son comes home, it is indeed the father who pardons. Yet the confession and the pardon all take place in the presence of the servants who do the father's bidding. Here are the exact words. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and make merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Those servants who hear the confession are the Lord's ministers. His priests, you may say, who by the Lord's own commission clothe the penitent once more in the holiness of their baptism and welcome him home into the great feast. Look at the Acts of the Apostles, 
where we read that there were believing Christians who had sinned by practicing magic or occult practices, and that they confessed those sins before the apostles. We read also that St. James says, Confess your sins to one another, and says this in connection with the anointing of the sick, which is specifically said to be administered by the priests. St. Paul speaks of his apostolic authority to pardon sins in the presence, that is, literally, in the person of Christ. So he says in 2 Corinthians, And the apostle ratifies the penitential decisions made by the pastors of the church at Corinth, in much the same way as a bishop gives faculties to a priest to hear confessions and to give absolution. St. Paul writes to the Galatians, that each man will have to bear his own load, that is, each will have to examine his own conscience and his works, and will have to repent of his sins in a personal way. At the same time, the penitent does so as a member of a holy community of baptized believers that is also a company of penitents, helping one another along the way of repentance and ongoing conversion. So the apostle says, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So that if your neighbor has gone astray, you may restore him in a spirit of gentleness. So says St. Paul to the Galatians. The ashes that we receive on our foreheads on Ash Wednesday are the sign of that interior conversion to which we are called in the company of all who belong to Christ Jesus our Lord. Since the bishop or priest represents Christ, he also represents Christ's entire church in the process of confession and reconciliation. Confession is deeply personal, but it is not purely private, since it involves the entire body of Christ. So it is fitting that the confession of sins takes place discreetly and under the seal of the confessional, though with the prayer and the support of the entire church in heaven and on earth. What is clear, though, from the Bible and from holy tradition is that confession and reconciliation are mediated by a community and by a priestly ministry. Our process of conversion is assisted also by Our Lady and the saints and our guardian angels. Christ himself tells us that the angels rejoice over the repentance of sinners. That is how our Lord has chosen to save and sanctify us, not as atomized individuals, but as members of his mystical body, his church. It is not our place to argue with God or to think we know better than Christ and his apostles and his saints. We walk the penitential path together. Now all this is very hard for many people to accept, like the truth of Christ's true presence in the Eucharist, the Catholic teaching about the sacrament of penance and the nature of the priesthood are hard sayings. Yet in the end we must answer in Peter's words, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. <laughs>